Hello, this is the Norse Woods Podcast, where we talk about tales from Norse mythology and the meaning behind them. My name is Everett. And I'm Colleen. We are back. We're back. On an unexpected hiatus, we will be back to a semi-regular upload schedule, hopefully. But it is my fault. Just been very busy lately. Crazy busy. And I just want to get right back into it because we got a lot to talk about today. Last time we talked about the creation myth in Norse mythology, talked about Yggdrasil and just kind of an introduction to Norse paganism as well. Mm -hmm. But now I want to talk about Odin. Odin, Woden, however you want to call him, call them. Why are there so many different pronunciations? Odin, as we know Odin today, is an amalgamation of many different gods from many different nations, tribes, peoples all across Northern Europe. And it's just kind of all been lumped together into a singular character. Oh, I thought you were going to say people are Norse pagans no, all across the no. world. So okay. Odin is definitely the central figure from a lot of different ancient practices, cultures, traditions. Mm -hmm. I was actually looking at a list of all of his names. He's got like at least like 75 different names. Sure. Um, but now we just call him Odin. Wow. Okay. I did not know that at all. So Odin is one of the most significant and arguably the most important god from Old Norse traditions. Odin is the Allfather, the One-Eyed, and the Raven God. However, Odin is a very complicated character. He is a great warrior, but an even greater mind. His intellect is rivaled by few other beings. And the most important thing to Odin is not his creations, not his home Asgard, not his rivals and enemies, and not even his family. The most important thing to Odin is a deeper understanding of the universe, and a common theme that constantly reappears in Norse poetry is that no sacrifice is too great in the hunt for knowledge. But despite his often outmatched intellect, Odin is also extremely rash. He's quick to come to judgments and often charges into battle without a second thought. Odin is also very self-centered, and as we see in many stories throughout the Eddas, he will often leave his seat in Asgard to go on his own personal quests. And today, we're going to talk about a few of those quests and some of the deeper meanings behind those quests that we can take away. I think it's interesting that he's considered to be super intellectual, all-father, mm -hmm. but extremely rash. I, I kind of find that refreshing. Because I guess being raised in a Christian faith, you get the feeling that the one God is all powerful, all knowing, but also like very patient and has unknown reasoning behind every decision that he makes. Whereas that's what the Christians at least want you to think that yes. he's patient. But as evident in the Old Testament, God is also very self centered. And is yes. going to but the, kill yeah. anyone that doesn't believe in him. Right. The Old Testament God and the New Testament God seem very uh, different. But it's refreshing to me that you would describe the Father God as rash and hard-headed. Because that's kind of what life seems. <laughs> I don't know. Just it, it seems more human. And, and just like to go off the introduction to Odin... As a character, or if you believe in a true Odin, he would love nothing more than to be all-knowing, all-powerful. Sure. He is definitely not that, as we will see in these stories. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the secret of the Nordic runes. So the three Norns, which we talked about briefly in our first episode, the Norns Erd, Ferdandi, and Skuld know the past, present, and future of the universe. They use runes to write out the destinies of every being in the universe on the trunk of Yggdrasil. This not only serves as a record of each being, but it's also significant that the runes are carved into Yggdrasil, because the fates of every being are spread throughout the Nine Worlds because all is contained within Yggdrasil, and the destiny of everything is given to the Cosmic Tree by these three Norns. They know the fate of all people, giants, dwarves, animals, and also the gods, and in the minds of a lot of people, that actually does place the Norns above the gods themselves. But all they're interested in is recording the destinies of everyone, and as some believe, possibly changing the destinies of everyone. Hmm. 
So Odin knows of the importance of the runes, and from his seat at the head of Asgard, he witnesses these three women writing with them. He envied the power of the runes, and wanted more than nothing else to understand them. The Well of Erd is home to the Norns, and also home to the runes. And it's said that the runes would only reveal their meaning to those who are worthy to understand them, because with this knowledge comes the understanding of fate itself. So we're talking like the roots, rune stones, like the runes on rune stones that people might recognize. Mm-hmm. And so there never has been a defined meaning. It's supposed to have always been revealed to you spiritually. Uh, it depends. So we have supposed meanings that are applied to every rune. Mm-hmm. And some runes have very particular definitions, like this one means Odin, mm-hmm. this one means Thor, but you know, so forth. But who I, came up with that? No one knows. There's just meanings, definitions, or just themes that are applied to every rune. And we'll do an episode on the runes in the future. But people, you know, work with runes and try to read the runes in the same way they may read tarot and a bunch of other different mm-hmm. divination techniques. But in this case, runes not only applies to the writing themselves, but just the deeper understanding of fate. Got it. So in order to prove his strength in body and mind, Odin hung himself from a branch of Yggdrasil. He stabbed his own side with his own spear and stared into the dark waters of the Well of Erd. He would not allow any of the gods or goddesses to come to his aid, and he remained silent for nine days and nights staring intently into the water, and he called on the runes for their meaning. And we have the number nine show up constantly throughout any story, basically, within the Eddas. Nine is just the significant number, meaning completeness or, you know, maybe holiness. It's just the perfect number, basically, to encompass everything. In the same way in Christian faith, the number three is usually that. I thought it was seven. Seven, two, and 20, technically, and 40. <laughs> There's a lot of different numerology Yeah, bits. so do you have any idea as to why nine might be? Or is that just some... Uh, there's nine realms within each result. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Interesting, I was thinking when you described hung from a tree and stabbed in the side. Some we'll, we'll intense talk, Christian we'll imagery We'll talk about there. comparisons, yes. So at the end of the ninth night, the runes answered Odin's request. From the deep waters of the Well of Erd, the shapes and meanings of the runes were revealed to Odin, and he was one of the few who knew their secrets, and he said the following. Then I was fertilized and became wise. I truly grew and thrived. From a word to a word, I was led to a word. From a work to a work, I was led to a work. Now, with the knowledge of the runes and a deeper understanding of the universe, Odin became more powerful and received new magic or magics. Some of these new powers were the ability to heal both physical and mental wounds, bind enemies in battle, and even raise the dead. It is believed that later in time, Odin gave the forms of the runes to humans, allowing them to use them for their own writing. So he didn't reveal their secrets, he just gave humans their shapes in order to apply them to record keeping. Okay. Okay. So he gave them an alphabet, but no necessarily meaning behind each one. Correct. Yes. So let's talk about some deeper meanings with the story. And I mean, I I really boiled down this story to the core message because that's really all there is to take away from the story. But the obvious takeaway is the importance of sacrifice, but there's a lot more to sacrifice than just the way we know it. Mm -hmm. So Odin stabbed himself and hung himself for nine days, and this became known throughout Northern Europe as an Odinic sacrifice. Back in older times, there is evidence of people being offered to Odin in the same way that Odin offered himself to the runes. The poetic Edda and the Havamal describe the story from the perspective of Odin, so it's in first person. And he uses a phrase that roughly translates to, given to Odin, myself to myself. So he made the ultimate version of the Odinic sacrifice by sacrificing himself to himself. So the idea here is that Odin had to sacrifice himself in order to receive a new version of himself, one with a better understanding of the cosmos. Now today, we are obviously not partaking in human sacrifice. And did Norse pagans in the past participate in human sacrifice? Yes. Oh, okay. There is definitely evidence of that. So we're not partaking in that today. For this purpose? 
among many purposes, yes, but it is the ultimate sacrifice to sacrifice a life. To Odin. Or to many different things. Okay. But even though we're not using human sacrifice today, we can look at this story as a tale of personal sacrifice or a call to better ourselves. So if we want to receive something, we need to give up something important to us, whether it's our time, effort, or anything of value. The more you set your mind to something, the more you have to gain. So you definitely mentioned the Christian comparison. Yeah, yes. I mean, to me, that was very obvious, especially the idea of a, a spear to the side. Mm-hmm. Is, I mean, that's like um, imagery that shows up a lot in like literature in reference to the death of Christ. Right. And I didn't really necessarily prepare an actual part of my script to talk about this because I knew we were going to talk about it. The thing that comes to mind, though, nine days and nights for Odin Mm -hmm. in his hanging. For Jesus hanging on the cross, it was three hours. Mm -hmm. I believe, right? Is Is that correct? Three hours. And then he was dead for three days before rising again. It had to have been more than three hours, but it was a it all variable in a day, of three. Though. Yeah, you so, you might be right. But either way, there's that connection of the perfect number in Christianity of Correct. three yeah. to the perfect number of nine in paganism mm-hmm. or Norse paganism. So I had the thought, what came first, obviously. Right. Now, it's so hard to determine that because the stories of Jesus dying on the cross definitely date back to first, second century, right? Sure. Around 2,000 years ago. Right. We can't date these stories past when the Poetic Edda and the Havamal were written. Mm -hmm. And the earliest record we have of those being written was about somewhere between 900 and 750. Okay. But these are written records of oral tales. Right. But the the farthest we can prove it is when it was written down. I mean, you don't date oral tales, so. And the important thing to note, though, is even though it was put on a written record after the Bible, that was before these people, whether it be in Norway, Sweden, Iceland, before they were ever exposed to Christianity. It was before they were evangelized and before they were converted. because they were some of the last people. Right, especially in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So the question is, did they somehow get exposed to the tale of Jesus dying on the cross, even though they weren't converted, and then applied that to their own stories of Odin and other gods? Mm -hmm. Or is it a weird synchronicity? Where they each had that show up in their own religions, or was it... Prior to the tales of Christianity and Christianity adapted it, though, if Norse pagans were some of the last people to be converted to Christianity, at least in Europe. Yes. Right. I imagine I'm not a historian, so I could sound like a complete idiot, but I imagine Christians who are doing the evangelizing were not exposed to the stories of Odin either. So they were both kind of created in a vacuum because I can't imagine that it was based off of the stories of Norse paganism if neither group was exposed to the other. That's what I thought, too. Though it's very possible that they were exposed to the stories. It it, it could be either way, but I'm thinking to myself, too, and this is what I think about at night when I can't sleep. You say that about a lot of things. I know. I just think about a lot of stuff. Um, we're all humans, obviously, and we all had to come from a certain area mm-hmm. as a species. And it's not like humans just popped up simultaneously in Iceland and then also in Jerusalem. Right? Sure. So where did we come from? Are these stories of the Bible and the Poetic Edda, are they coming from the same singular source of human thought from millennia ago so stories passed from the dawn of human civilization and the dawn of human thought right so we all like somehow have some weird genetic proclivity towards certain stories or we've just been telling the same stories and they've been changing slightly as we Uh, right and as it's been thousands and thousands of years there's no way to connect them that's interesting just to think thought. about. Yeah. It's, it reminds me of just language in general, though. You usually should be able to tie it back to a main source. Right. You know what I mean? Like think uh, Proto-Indo-European. 
you can, there are thousands of languages that we can all trace back to that one Mm Proto-Indo-European by doing guesswork and, you know, equations and I'm wondering if there's a way to do that with these, uh, oral these stories, tradition. Yeah, and yeah them. that would be very interesting well, that's the to thing look with into. Norse tales and Norse paganism, it is 80% guesswork because yeah. so much yes. is lost. Right. But yeah, well, that's the, that first tale. But now I want to talk about a new tale, the tale of Mimir's well. So the well of Erd is not the only home to secret knowledge. A very wise being named Mimir had his own well at a root of Yggdrasil, and his intellect was only rivaled by the Norns and Odin himself. Some theorize that Mimir was a brother to Odin's mother Bestla, but there is no definite relation of Mimir to Odin. Mimir gains his knowledge by drinking from his well every morning, gaining knowledge of unnamed secrets. So one day, Odin visited Mimir at his home. He asked Mimir for a drink from his well. Mimir was the guardian of the well, not only because of the secrets the well contained, but also because of its importance to the survival of Yggdrasil. Mimir told Odin that he could only take a drink from the well after Odin proved his worthiness. Now, it's highly debated if Odin took the time to consider what sacrifice could be done, or if he immediately came to this conclusion, or if Mimir said, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. Either way... In the end, Odin gouged out one of his eyes and dropped it into the well. Mimir was satisfied with the sacrifice and dipped his drinking horn into the well and gave it to Odin to drink. Odin then gained secrets that are not revealed to humans, but from this point onward, he is known as the One-Eyed God. So Interesting choice. An eye. Yes. So let's talk about the meaning of that. Yeah. So this is obviously another story of sacrifice. And for Odin, no sacrifice is too great for the hunt for knowledge. However, the metaphor in this story was even more important for the Old Norse, and it was definitely not lost on them. Odin gave up his gift of perception by sacrificing part of his eyesight and in turn received enhanced perception. So this story parallels the story of Odin's hanging. Odin sacrificed his lower self to become his higher self. The same is true for the story of Mimir's well. He sacrifices a lower version of himself, and in the end, came out more spiritually stronger. So, losing an eye, Mm -hmm. gaining a third eye. An inner eye. Right. Got it. It's a very, um, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but the timing is perfect for this. In that it's like spring, it's almost Ostara, and Mm -hmm. the idea is sacrifice throughout the winter in order to gain throughout the summer. That's true. Just interesting timing. Let's talk about Hugin and Munin. So the two tales we talked about are definitely the most significant examples of Odin's quest for knowledge, but his quest is never ending. Sometime after he drank from Amir's well, there was a war between the Aesir and the Vanir, who are a rival tribe of gods. Not much is known about the war or the Vanir themselves, really, as many of these tales were lost to time. What is known is that after some time, both sides grew tired of the conflict and they came to a truce. As a symbol of good faith, both sides gave up some of their own members and traded them with each other to live among the others. Among the the veneer that the Aesir received were Njord and his children Freyr and Freya, and among those that the Aesir gave up was Mimir. Mimir was not fully on board with the situation, and after arriving in Vanaheim, he was reluctant to share his intellect. And the Vanir felt that they were cheated in the exchange, and they decapitated Mimir and sent his head to Asgard. Upon receiving the head of Mimir, Odin treated the wounds with various herbs and used secret magic, likely the magic that he gained from drinking from Mimir's well, Mm -hmm. and he gave life to Mimir again but it was just his head. So he kept the head of Mimir close and throughout the Eddas would turn to the head of Mimir for knowledge and advice. I'm entirely, (laughs) I'm entirely picturing the Futurama. No. Well, (laughs) yes, that was my first image, but now I'm picturing that um, shrunken head on the third Harry Potter 
on the bus. stupid bus. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the shrunken head from Beetlejuice. No, no, but I did. My first thought was actually Futurama and those heads in jars. Yeah. Well, that that's just one way that Odin maintains his quest for knowledge. It's an ongoing quest, so he goes back to Mimir often. Sure. Okay. But another way he does this, we can't forget that Odin is not omnipresent. He may be among the most intelligent beings in the universe, but he cannot be everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. So in order to continue to gain news of events across the Nine Realms, Odin uses his two ravens named Hugin and Munin, which translate to thought and memory. They are his eyes and ears for where he cannot be and also serve as his messengers. Odin is often depicted with Hugin and Munin perched on his shoulders. Odin's ravens are seen in the archaeological record in various coins, statues, and other surviving artifacts. Odin is often depicted as wearing horns or antlers, but it's likely because surviving artifacts that show him with horns have actually lost portions of the entire statue or whatever the artifact is. So the horns or antlers are more likely Hugin and Munin, but partially broken off after centuries have passed. On multiple mm -hmm. depictions? Because they're just weird appendages. Sure, on the shoulders. Out. Yep, okay. So when they, parts of them break off, it looks like he has weird antlers or horns. No, that makes sense. It's kind of like the mistranslation in, in Christian artwork where a lot of saints are depicted with horns when re in reality it was meant to be a halo. Right. Or like, you know, beams of light. That sort of idea. So, I mean... And if anyone, you know, prefers to, you know, depict Odin with horns or antlers, that's still fine because, you know, that is one common depiction of him. Mm -hmm. And I will say when Joseph from Saturday Morning Cartoon Boom on Nerd Sloth was drawing our artwork for the Norsewoods podcast, he did initially put antlers on Odin and mm -hmm. I requested him to change it because... In my mind, because you got to be historically accurate. In, in my mind, he doesn't have antlers or, sure. or horns because it was never stated anywhere that he did. Though there's no proof that he wasn't depicted with horns. It's just assumed that those were likely the ravens. Right. It's possible they were actually horns. And it definitely is possible. There's just no proof that he did wear horns or antlers. As far as you know, there's nothing in either of the Eddas or in the oral tradition with him having Correct. horns. Okay. Yes. Interesting. I wonder if that's where the horns came from for like, um, what's that opera with the Vikings? Do you know what I'm talking about? Where yeah. they're always depicted with wearing the hats with the horns on them? Well, and I mean, a lot of gods and goddesses and then Vikings in general did wear horns. I don't think they did. I, we can talk about that in a future episode. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there are ones that did. Sure, for sure. sure. Well, you would know better than me. So regardless, we're moving on to my favorite story. Okay. So this story is about the mead of poetry. Nice. This one's a little longer, too. And I even cut back a lot of the story, but there's a lot of twists and turns in this story. So in addition to the exchange of gods at the end of the war between the Aesir and the Vanir, there was also a seal to the treaty where each of them spit into a collective bowl, each of the Aesir and the Vanir. Okay. After, Gross. Yeah. After each of them added their spit, a being was actually created from it. His name was Kvasir, which okay. actually translates to fermented berry juice. All right. I mean, literal. He was the most intelligent human to ever live. And that's probably because he is taking a little bit from every deity. Is he human? Yes. He's made out of spit. But he's human. What I mean, also humans are made from wood. Yeah, it's just he's not... He's made out of something completely different, but somehow they came to the same conclusion. I mean, Eve was created out of a rib of Adam while he was created from the dirt. All right. So cool. Cool. He, yes, he was definitely a human. And he was the most intelligent one. Okay. He traveled the world and gave advice to many. And it said that he could provide a satisfactory answer to any question. However, one day he was duped when he was invited to the home of two dwarves named Fjallar and Galler which translate to deceiver and screamer. When Kvasir entered their home, the two dwarves killed him and used his blood to brew a batch of mead. And since his name means fermented berry juice, I thought that made sense. Delish. 
This mead contained his knowledge, and any who drank it would become a scholar or a poet. This mead eventually came into the possession of a Jotun named Sutung, who took Fjallar and Galar hostage after they killed his father and mother. Sutung hid the remaining barrels of mead in a chamber hidden underneath a mountain. Now Odin learned of the mead from Hugin and Munin, who either witnessed the events or learned of them in some manner. And in his quest for knowledge, Odin knew that the mead had to be his. So first, Odin disguised himself as an unassuming farmhand and traveled to the home of Sutung's brother, Baugi. Through a little bit of trickery, he caused Baugi's nine farmhands, again nine, to accidentally slay each other. Now, how well, he, how, <laughs> how, how <laughs> he did happened? so, how he did so, he tossed, Odin tossed something into the air. And I, I forget what it was from the story. He tossed something into the air and it caused the nine farmhands to use their scythes to like swing at it. But they all just ended up like either decapitating or slaying each other in the process. Brutal. So they all died. All right. <laughs> so now without workers, Baugi agreed to allow Odin to complete the farm work of nine people for a sip of his brother's mead because he did not think it would be possible for one man to complete the work of nine. Odin, of course, easily completed their work in one day, being a god with magical powers. Mm -hmm. And Baugi was forced to ask his brother Sutung for a sip of mead. Sutung was outraged and declined and Odin reminded Baugi that he could not break their agreement. And that is definitely a common theme, not only in these tales of Norse mythology, but the Norse people in general. Oath-breaking was basically one of the worst, quote-unquote, sins you could commit. If you agree to something, you have to follow through with it. Cool. So, since he was oath-bound, I don't know if it was actually an oath, but he was agreement-bound, sure. Baugi led them to an area of the mountain that was closest to the underground chamber, and by direction of Odin, Baugi drilled a hole through the rock. When the hole was complete, Odin transformed into a snake to slither through the hole, and Baugi tried to kill him in the process because he was enraged by the trickery. But he didn't get him. Sure. Odin's in the chamber. And guarding this chamber was the daughter of Sutung, Gunlod. Odin transformed into a handsome young man and charmed her. So just a handsome young man shows up in her house. Yep. Randomly. In, in a locked not chamber. through the door. And just, she's like, ooh. Yes. She must have been real lonely. Now, here's he has to do all this work to get a sip of mead that was promised to him to begin with. How yes. rude is that? Yep. It so is. He, that guy did not hold up his end of the bargain. Is he going to consider this as being held up even though he had to do all of this work to get it relations between the gods and the Yotan are Strained. obviously <laughs> not the best <laughs> so like i said he charmed her and it was funny that you said she was lonely because he proposed that if he could offer her three nights of pure pleasure <laughs> God, that's such a dude thing to say she would allow him to take three sips of meat gunlaud agreed and after three nights of pleasure, Odin got access to the remaining three barrels of mead. She had agreed to let him take three sips, but before she could say anything or stop him, Odin drank the entire three barrels. Well, he's entitled to four sips because of that original agreement. I mean, <laughs> he's true. done a lot of work here. So, so I assume he's got this, that he did this all in three sips. Yeah, he was so, like, "I'll take a sip," but then can drink a barrel in a single sip because he's Odin. Is that it? The idea is that he took that's his three barrels around. or the three vats and consumed all of them in a single drought. So, like, just constant, never breathing, just drank them all. Oh, okay. So he wasn't. I mean, the workaround would be like that is a sip. I'm yeah, Odin. It's, it's trickery, regardless. Yes. Right. Got it. Got you. So as soon as he finishes the mead, Odin transforms into an eagle and leaves the chamber and flies toward Asgard. Gunlad told her father of the stranger, and Sutung also took the shape of an eagle and pursued Odin. One of two things happened next, because the sources differ slightly. In one version, Odin arrived at Asgard and vomited the mead into new barrels for safekeeping, but in the process, a few drops of mead fell to, 
fell to Midgard. In the other version, Sutung catches up to Odin and is able to have a short fight while they're in eagle form, which causes Odin to literally shit out a few drops of mead, which then fall to Midgard. <laughs> I uh, guess birds can't control. Yes, they have the cloaca. <laughs> <laughs> Their bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, there's drops of mead that fall to Midgard. Okay, okay. And these drops of mead are said to be the source of bad poetry in humanity. Well, because humans just can't, what, digest correctly? No, it's just it's just acknowledging that there is bad poetry in the world. And well, this it's got to be bad it. if it's going to come from the blood of a... Because it was either vomited magic. or shitted out. Okay, yes. Now that makes sense. That is, that, that does make sense. Most poetry is just shit out on the paper, it feels so, like. So those drops of meat are the source of that, but... Truly talented poets and scholars are said to have been gifted their knowledge by Odin himself and take a, whether it be a literal or a metaphorical sip of his mead. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about some of the meanings in this story. So this tale shows that Odin is willing to use any means necessary to get what he wants, not just sacrifice like the previous stories, but in this story, he uses his mind and not warfare. So he uses trickery, magic, and sex to get what he wanted. Now, this is very important to note because, as we have said before, Odin is a very complex character. The Old Norse tended to believe that strength and skilled use of weapons were masculine traits, and the use of magic and reading poetry were more feminine traits. Now, Odin is skilled in all of these areas. And for this reason, Odin was possibly not the most venerated god in many Norse traditions, despite him being the Allfather, because he had not only masculine traits, but also feminine traits. So the Old Norse also understood that Odin usually acts out of his own self-interest and does not often intervene in, intervene in human affairs. So that being said, it's more likely that other gods, particularly Thor, were the most favored of the gods when it came to worship in old Norse countries or areas. Can you tell me if there are other stories where Odin is on a quest for something that isn't knowledge, but something more like physical? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, because I can imagine you would want to worship one god for one thing and one god for another thing. For instance, like Thor, if you're on your way to battle, but Odin, if you're looking for some sort of knowledge. But it is a little strange if Odin encompasses all of them, why you would even have other gods. Well, that's what I thought, too. And it's really because, like we said at the top of the episode, Odin is a combination of a bunch of different gods. Mm -hmm. So is it it is the reason that Odin encompasses so many different traits of intelligence and strength because he is the all-powerful all-father, or is it because he encompasses older stories of many different forms of gods, deities, mm -hmm. whatever, all mashed into one person? Yeah. This kind of reminds me of, I believe it was the Romans, like when they conquered people's nations, tribes— it wasn't that they were like, oh, these people are worshiping strange gods. They would say something like, oh, this god seems to be their version of Aphrodite. You yeah. know what I mean? So they would project their goddess onto whatever that people's goddess was. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I assume over time as the, that area got more and more Romanized, they may have referred to their goddess as Aphrodite while really it retained some of the original traits of the goddess they were originally worshipping. Did any of that make sense? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. So, and I, I kind of get what you're saying because there are definitely similarities, synchronicity, synchronicities, whatever you want to call it, between Norse mythology and a bunch of other different practices. Uh, one of the ones that definitely comes to mind for me are the Norns and the Three Fates from Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um, they have very similar meanings, but the question is, did the Three Norns become what they are after things were written down and they were influenced by Greek philosophy? Mm -hmm. Or is it on an honest coincidence that there's three women fates that basically 
determine the life of everything. I mean, the logical person in me wants to say it wasn't a coincidence right. that they influenced each other. Mm -hmm. But the other part of me wants to think they had to have had two similar things that merged together. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't just take one idea and glue it to a completely different idea. They had to have had similar or origins similarities in order to merge them together yep. you know what i mean so yep. it, i'd be interested to to know what the origins of each one were well at least with the tales of the norse we don't know right. the origins yes. no of course um that's that's all i had to share about the quest for knowledge for odin odin is obviously one of the most important characters in the eddas so we're always going to be talking about odin but those are his, at least in my mind, the most significant stories related to his quest for knowledge, which are a lot of the first sequential stories. And why did he have such a uh, like desire for knowledge? It's just what he wants. He wants to know how everything works. And eventually, in the way future, we'll talk about Ragnarok, too, mm -hmm. because there's so many things we have to talk about beforehand. But I will say this now. In terms of Ragnarok, the gods were made of aware of the events of Ragnarok before they happen mm -hmm. through the fates, through the Norns. So maybe part of his reasoning for wanting knowledge of how the universe works is because he knows his future. He knows how he's going to die. So he wants to know maybe there's a way I can prevent it. Ah. Maybe there's a way that I can change events to happen. Or maybe he just wants to know why. Ragnarok's going to happen. Okay. Now, that's just my thought. There's sure. no proof to that. Well, there's no proof to any of it, really. <laughs> right. But Odin is also just the Allfather. He's arguably the most powerful god. So maybe he just wants more knowledge for himself to continue to retain his seat of Asgard. But we'll come back to that. Yeah. But in conclusion, I just want to say this. So he's, like I said, going to re reappear throughout many future episodes because he's like the central figure in uh, in Asgard. Mm -hmm. But next episode, we're going to be talking about a new character. This god was possibly even more important to the ancient Norse people as he was a more relatable figure and also the protector of Midgard and humans. So next time, I want to discuss Thor and his importance to the everyday person. How is it that modern-day Norse pagans interpret these stories into their, like, daily practice. These particular ones about Odin's quest for knowledge. Modern day, you said? Yeah, like, you as a Norse pagan. I mean, How would you take that in terms of, like, incorporating that story into your practice? All, all the stories are, are the most These recent meat specific of specific Odin's quest for knowledge. So, so the first two stories are definitely tales of sacrifice. So mm -hmm. it's how do you give up something of value to better yourself? whether it be an offering to a, your particular god that you may worship in the mm -hmm. faith, or is it just something how you're bettering yourself, right? So even taking at the most minimal level, working out, getting fit, you're sacrificing your time and your effort, and in a lot of cases, your physical and mental abilities in order to become more healthy, mm -hmm. right? But you can take it a step further and be a little more like, how do I give up something of value to please Odin? And I've heard of a lot of people just saying I, they, they brew their own batch of like beer or mead mm -hmm. and offer him some of it. So it could be just something as simple as I'm going to use my own money, my own time to create something and then give a portion of it away to my worshipped deity. For what in return? Depends. Okay, so it's kind of like a prayer. Yeah, for sure. And any sort of offering is a form of prayer. Absolutely. Sure. You're, right. But you're giving up something. Got it. So that idea of sacrifice is definitely something, not just in Norse paganism, but in any form of paganism, whether you're offering something to a deity or just to a, a spirit of some kind, you have to give up something in order to worship. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So th those two tales, the first two tales, are definitely that. 
But that third tale, when Odin gets the meat of poetry, I think that tale is significant because it proves that Odin is not just a person that's determined to do stuff by sacrificing. He's also determined to use trickery, um, to use not just warfare, but what he has available to him to get what he wants. Mm -hmm. So you can use that as a an idea of determination, right? Like you're trying to do whatever you can to get what you want. Mm -hmm. So that's all I got. <laughs> no, I'm just interested to see how how these might be interpreted in modern day. So, yeah. And that's the thing about paganism. You can take it however you want. Because, well, you could say that about any religion, really. Well, not really, though, because with other faiths like Christianity, Hebrew, Islam, they have leaders, right? Yes. Telling them what to do. There is no leader in paganism. True. But, I mean, in terms of religious belief, you may have very strict and specific rules and beliefs written down, but not everybody is going to subscribe to those beliefs. That's and true. And they will still refer to themselves as Christian, Muslim, uh, Jewish. You right. know, like, you're never going to subscribe to every belief that's written down. Or maybe you do, and in which case, that, you have some great... That, that's a good point, but I guess... I don't know. And we talked a little bit about this in our first episode. There, there's so many different forms of Norse paganism and in so many different countries, but without a central leadership or a central organization you're kind of left to your own to listen to whoever you want, practice however you want. And that's how these, you know, fringe groups like uh, white supremacists pop up and, sure. you know, take certain things and apply it to their own whatever. Mm -hmm. But of, of course that can happen in any religion, but it's a little bit more difficult to blame Christianity as a whole because they have their priests Very and bishops and the popes. Correct. Right. Yes. And they and they obviously can just say, no, they are not associated with us. Right. Because these are our beliefs. But it's so much harder for a pagan to say that because, you know, you hear the negative news and then everyone applies that to everyone of the faith. Mm -hmm. And there's no one to say, you know, they're not representing of us. Sure. No, that makes sense. And it sucks to leave it on that negative note, Colleen. But it wasn't a negative note. <laughs> well, it's an informative one. Well, next episode, it will not be a two or three month wait like it was this time. I'll be at you in a couple weeks, I'm hoping. And we will talk about Thor and the the everyday uh, pagan a little bit more than this episode. Sounds good. And hey, Odin. Hey, Odin. And, oh, I should also say this. If you do have any questions or comments, definitely send it over to the email for this podcast. It would be uh, norsewoodspod at gmail.com. I will answer any questions you have. Yep. You can also um, write to us on the Nerd Sloth Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. We can also answer any questions you have on there. But if you have, like, a long, extended question, um northwoodspod at gmail.com is probably the best way to go. And the socials for Nerd Sloth are all at Nerd Sloth HQ. That's right. <laughs> we end this show differently than we do for a little spooky, which is other, our other show. So I'm lost because it's been so long since <laughs> we'll we've done this show. We'll get better at it over time. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for listening and have a great day. Hail Odin. Hail Odin. Presented by Nerd Sloth, a place for lazy nerds. If you like what you heard, consider donating at patreon.com slash nerd sloth so we can continue bringing you quality shows. Be sure to also leave us a review and share your favorite episodes and clips on social media. If you're looking for more content, visit us at nerdsloth.com.